work now. There we go. Okay, we're excited today to be here at Opossum Bottom Farm with Chris Tice. And uh, Chris is a vegetable producer, and we're going to kind of go through his operation here and talk about how he got started probably first. So, Chris, how did you get started in this, and why did you do this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd worked in IT for a little over 18 years and just decided it was time to do something different. I'd been in gardens since I was eight years old and really wanted to kind of do something with the place and uh, started looking around for um, a model I could use to do what I wanted to do. The models that were out there were traditional farming. They really weren't going to work here. We don't, there's no way you can get a regular four wheel tractor in here. It will sink and you'll constantly be pulling it out. The, there's no bridges across this creek. Um, you start getting into EPA regulations if you start trying to build a bridge. So when I started looking around, I ran into uh, uh, John Martin Fortier. I started looking at what he was doing, and it made a lot of sense. Um, and then when I was looking at him, I saw Curtis Stone. Started looking at Curtis, and he was doing it one person, which is where I knew I needed to go was one person. Now, Jean Martin, he has all kinds of people helping him. I don't. It's just me. So, as Curtis was doing it solo, I borrowed a lot of stuff from him on efficiency, and then I was already sold on the BCS. That was immediate. That was the thing that was going to make it possible was to get one of those, and uh, look at all the other tools that went in involved in it and doing it. Um, I said, okay, this model's going to work. Mm -hmm. um, so I started grabbing stuff and putting it together. And uh, in, I believe it was um, 2018, we started, I started prepping the fields. And we went in and got uh, a lot of compost, a lot of compost, um, and started building all the beds. Um, all this was raised beds, but I've taken the upper down. Uh, to flat beds to help reserve water there. Mm -hmm. We get way too much here, but on the upper beds, um, they don't get enough. Mm -hmm. And the way I have it set right now, we don't need to irrigate until probably September. Okay. Um, and how big an area do you actually have here? Each zone is 50 by 40. And you get 10 beds. Each bed is 125 square feet, so you got 1,250 square feet in cultivation on each zone. We have one, two, three, four zones right now that I use, so about a little over 5,000 square feet. So we're not even a tenth of an acre yet. Okay. Um, it's under cultivation. We do um, a lot of uh, high turnover beds. So they're 30 days in the nursery, 30 days in the field, they're gone. We put something else in. The basic business model is each bed has to produce X amount of dollars per season. And then that's, that's kind of the way we look at the crops we're going to grow, whether we do short term, long term, what's going in uh, based on what selling at market uh, and the demand at any given time. Okay. Uh, it gives me a lot of flexibility to do it that way versus just saying, okay, I'm only going to do this or I'm only going to do that. If something's not selling, if something's not working, I yank it up and put something else in. Okay, so let's walk over here and see your where you start your flowers or your plants. Um, and talk about a little bit, you know, where you're going from here. Well, this is mostly the compost pile here. Okay. And then we use this as hardening off. Um, all this stuff has been in the nursery way too long and needs to be in the ground, but the freeze backed us way up. We've got watermelons, peppers, lettuce, um, lots more tomatoes. Inside the nursery, the nursery is nothing more than a sunroom at this point. Okay. Um, with, we've only got about, I see, what did I say, 240 square feet mm -hmm. to do stuff in there. Uh, double high tables. We use grow lights in the winter to keep everything moving so we can get as early as possible. Um, and then once they're ready, we start moving them out here let them get hardened off and then we'll start going out planting with it. Okay. And do you, you, per, you grow all your transplants yourself? All of them. We don't buy any transplants. Everything comes from seed. 
And what's your favorite companies to get seed from? That depends on the crop. Okay. For lettuce, I like Johnny's. For tomatoes, I have 39 different vendors. Um, for peppers, that's probably about 10 different vendors. Um, if we go any of the greens, I like to go to Johnny's. Okay. And then when, when we get the odd stuff, we go to Baker's Creek okay. and, get, and get them from there. And we use a lot of pelleted seed, which is why I like to go to Johnny's. Okay. And um, what when you start them, then just for people who are starting out, it depends on the variety, but you know, you start as early as when in the calendar year? We start in December. December. Okay. We start in December. I will start tomatoes in December. Um, we will run tomatoes up until uh, in the nursery until probably February where I start looking at planting. It, it depends on a lot of weather factors. The NAO, the AO, um, how the jet stream's acting, the polar vortex, where it's all sitting, what, it, what it's doing. And then I'll start watching from there and try and calculate when our last frost is going to be. I'm about 75% accurate on that. Okay. We lost our butts this year. Plain okay. and simple on and you, that. And how cold did it get? You said, and when was that? That was? That was early May. Okay. And here it dropped down to 25 degrees, between 29 and 25 for about four hours. Okay. And again, there was nothing here but low tunnels. That's, that's the only thing we had. I was able to run heat cables on a few things, and that helped but we still lost a little bit. Okay. The, like squash, there's no way it can withstand a freeze like that. It just died. Right. So we replanted. I had backups for it. Uh, to be quite honest, the um, eggplant did a whole lot better than I thought it would. It had just a little leaf burn on it, but it's mm -hmm. fine, it'll recover. Um, most everything took some hits on it, but it'll all recover. Okay. Um, it's, I've lost a week and a half, two weeks on some stuff. Some stuff I lost about four days on. It just depends on the crop. Uh, we did lose all the tomatoes on the vine, which was a shame. Mm -hmm. I was really looking forward to those. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. it is what it is. There's nothing you can do about it. Well, let's talk about the equipment that you bought okay. and, and why you bought this equipment. Okay, um, let's start with this. This is the one that makes it all possible. This is the backbone. Without this, nothing runs. It's sitting with a rotary plow on it. This is a BCS 835 automatic start. Um, it has um, all the bells and whistles in it. This was the flagship model when I got it. Um, and since nothing runs without it, I spared no expense on this. I got the best they had mm -hmm. at the time, which I paid about 7,500 just for the tractor itself. Mm -hmm. um, you're looking at about 1200 for the rotary plow. Um, the 30 inch tiller was about 1500. The dozer blade was right at, I think it was 600. Mm -hmm. um, those are all attachments that go onto it. I use every one of them uh, without question. If you're, when you, if you're gonna do raised beds and you have to have the rotary plow. Because that throws up a hill. It does, it digs mm -hmm. a ditch and it'll also plow your ground. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you, when you start on these and you want to break ground, you're going to start down the center. You're going to go one way, it's going to throw dirt one side. You come back down, throw dirt the other side. Then you reverse it and start filling in your ditch. And you go around and around and around the circle until you've plowed everything. Okay. And this, it'll go down to about a foot. Okay. It's, it's how far it goes, but okay. really you don't need much more than that. Okay. Um, it handles rocks very well because this place is absolutely full of rocks. Okay. It's the worst rocky place I've ever I've ever been in. And it does a fine job of getting those out. The tiller, I, there's just nothing better. There's a reason they call it the world's best tiller, and it is, without question. Um, we've got uh, this thing. It's been modified to run the... Uh, precision depth controller and what this does is you put the tiller on and this hooks to the tiller and it allows you to adjust the tilling depth on it. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do a sterile seed bed mm -hmm. and you lay down compost about two to three inches on top of your bed, you put your precision depth controller on your tiller and it's going to raise it where you're only working that top inch. Mm -hmm. That way you can get just as much as what you need in there uh, without disturbing and out raising us getting that seed bed started again mm -hmm. so you can keep it sterile mm -hmm. i don't do a lot of sterile seed beds i do two or three without the season it's for salad mix mm -hmm. uh, it just makes life a whole lot easier when you're seeding that in there and not have to pick weeds out of it right <laughs> right so and you also have the flame weeder okay uh, this was their very first model from farmer's friends 
Uh, I actually got it down in West Tennessee when I went to Rose Creek Farm. Um, they had uh, farmers' friends come down there and bring a bunch of stuff. They were setting up mm -hmm. their cat tunnels that they had, mm -hmm. and I bought it right off the truck that they had it. Um, they've got a lot more bells and whistles on it. That was about $1,100, if I'm not mistaken. But I use it for more than just flame weeding. I'll take that tank off and put CO2 on. And when I put CO2 on, I'll go through a bed. Like, we've got wire worms in this, and I'm going to have to treat this bed. I'm going to water it down. We're going to till it, water it down. I'm soaking wet. Put CO2 on that, go through, and freeze the bed. We'll freeze it solid. I'll take it, the CO2 off, put the propane back on it, and go back through and steam it real quick. And what this does, it creates a freeze thaw cycle that for wire worms, which have that exocilton on them, it cracks it and it kills them. So it's a completely organic way of doing it without having to use anything other than some CO2 and some propane. It works really well, especially with flea beetles. Anything with a, with a hard shell, any kind of beetle, any kind of exoskeleton, it works well with them. Everything else, uh, not so much. Okay. That's, that's a different story altogether. Um, it doesn't work real well, like on root maggot. It doesn't. It doesn't seem to bother them. So you're not actually using this for plant seed weed, weeds. You're using it for bugs more. I use it for insect control. Insect control. Um, I have used it, but here in my in covered. my location, flame weeding, in and of itself, is ineffective right uh, we have because of, and we'll go into that when I go over my beds and how I'm doing it mm -hmm. I'm not doing sterile seed beds on everything if I was doing sterile seed beds on it that's what I would use okay um, but I don't use sterile seed beds because we use so much fabric that right. I'm looking at instead of having an inch that's sterile right. I'm looking at having a foot that's sterile okay because I want to go down with carrots I want to go down with deep rooted vegetables maybe do some potatoes in here whatever we want to do if I want to go down deep then you're gonna to have to have it have it straightened up that way so yeah I use it for more in insect control right okay. um, this little thing I had this before I started and it's really good at kicking rocks I'll take it between the rows we'll do a little weeding there if we each get out of control I'll just take this thing through it and knock out the weeds it's since it's a counter rotating it picks up rocks really easy so if I've got a real rocky area even before I go in with this I'll go in with this and it kicks the rocks up real easy I can pick those out then we'll go back in with the tiller and straighten it up it's actually very useful if you've got rocky soil having one having access to one of these is it's handy okay. it's not absolutely necessary but it does make life a little easier okay and then we've got um, probably the best buy I made aside from the BCS was this this is a jang cedar it's precision cedar it pops out here and let's see where's my there it is you put your seed in you change out your rollers to whatever size you want adjust your brush and it does phenomenal it handles all this heavy clay um, the shoe is actually something that works. It's not like a chain on one of the other cedars. Right. It, it will actually cover everything very well. Right. Um, mine, I got in just under the wire, and we've got a kit of rollers that came with it, just a base kit. You can't do that anymore. If you buy these, you have to buy the rollers separately. Separate. Okay. Yep. Um, I just can't say enough good about this. If you're going to direct seed anything, this is the thing to have. Okay. Um, Your broad fork? The broad fork... I try to do on sterile seed beds. The problem with it here is that you're going to go about that deep and then you're going to need a hydraulic press to get it in the ground. Yeah. Um, unless you work these beds to death yeah. and get them, you're not going to use this. Right. There's too many rocks in it, the clay's too, clay's too much, and I've started adding in magnesium and calcium to break it up instead of lime. Lime messes with pH, and I didn't want to do that. Plus, everything here is calcium starved. And anywhere in East Tennessee, it's going to be calcium starved. So you throw in a lot of calcium, you throw in the magnesium, and that clay instantly breaks up, and it stays that way mm -hmm. um, for quite some time, actually. Then I can go in with this, okay. and then I can use it. But a lot of people, they, they want, I've seen them use it, and they flip the soil with it, and you're not supposed, that's not what it's for. Right. All you're doing is aerating. Right. That's it. And then you go back on top of compost, do whatever seed you're going to do and then move on okay. it's not a tiller it used to be you can use it as a tiller right but yeah that's what that's for <laughs> okay your hand tools um this is an absolute must a stirrup hoe you can 
extremely handy. You gotta have at least at least one. Right. Um, a regular hoe sometimes is handy. Uh, a spade works better if you need to. If you don't have right. three hundred or six hundred dollars, whatever these things are going for now, right. um, a spade works just as well. Okay. It does the exact same thing. Um, this this is a forty inch rake. And I use it a lot. If you're putting compost down on your beds, this will spread it out. Turn it upside down, get it nice and smooth, rake everything out. I use it all the time. Okay. Um, and then we have planting tools. Mm -hmm. That's what you want. Mm -hmm. Augers. Mm -hmm. if you, unless you want to spend forever out here planting. Right. That's what you want. Okay. Um, then we have if you're going to burn fabrics. When you burn fabrics, you can buy them pre-burnt if you want to, but it's expensive. Um, the simple thing to do is lay out your fabric as long as you want it. Mark one row off. You don't need to mark any more than one off. And you walk down, you fire it up, and boop, 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 go right along. It's a handmade thing. They don't make anything for it. I've seen people use, oh, all kinds of different... Uh, Oh, what templates that they'll put on top of mm -hmm. that takes forever. I ain't bending over getting on my knees. I'm just gonna walk along and do it. I've got way too much fabric to be doing that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, so I would recommend anybody that's gonna do it, make you something like this. It's a tin can with a piece of wood and, and coat hanger so yep. it doesn't burn. <laughs> it works just fine. <laughs> this is what happens when you get into rocky soil. That's what most of my rebar looks like. <laughs> it's all bent. Okay. And you um, got, uh, regular rake, which is quite handy, and a shovel, of course, you'll need if you're moving compost. We've also got two different kinds of insect netting. Um, the first one over here, this is specifically for flea beetles. It's a very fine tissue paper, kind of thin. It, it'll rip real easy, mm -hmm. but it does stop them cold. You don't have to, you don't have to fool with it. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually, and they both, both of these work as shea cloth. This is a much more heavy duty mm -hmm. kind of insect netting uh, that I would use like over uh, tomatoes or um, any kind of uh, kales or something where you're getting uh, mm -hmm. moss or something in. It works really good and I use it especially in the summer for shade cloth. And where do you get those? These I bought at a Canadian company called Dubois. And let's see, I can't remember what I paid for these. I think I paid this is a it's in meters this was a 328 meter roll i think and i paid probably 500 mm -hmm. i think six or seven hundred for this and three to five hundred for this okay. I, I actually it's been two years ago okay. um since i bought it so i don't really remember anchor pins you'll use these by the thousands mm -hmm. to put everything down in they're extremely handy Again, I got the I got my first one at Dubois, and then went away and bought directly from Dewitt. Um, they're about a hundred dollars for a case of five hundred, mm -hmm. so it's it's not bad. It's not too bad at all. Uh, for stringing anything, um, you can use Cecil if you have it, but I don't like Cecil. I've got some up there I'm using. I don't like it. It stretches way too much. Mm -hmm. Nylon bailing twine, much better. Zip ties, buy them out. <laughs> <laughs> Hand clips, you need them, hundreds of them. And what do you use those for? If we pull poly over any of the hoops, if we put Agrabon, if we put any kind of cover over, this is what we use. Okay. And we put those right on there. I've tried the, um, there's the PVC C clamps. Yep. They're long. The problem with those are is they're hard to get off, and if the wind blows, it, it tends to rip uh -huh. your cover. Yeah. So I went away from those pretty quick. Um, We've got a lot of messed up plastic along the ends where I was trying to, right. they just don't do very well. Um, these hand clamps, you can get them at Lowe's, you can get them Home Depot, you can get them anywhere. Okay. Um, they're extremely handy. Um, shade cloth. This is your standard shade cloth. It's a 30% black um, that we'll throw on there. If you stretch it really tight, you'll get like a 25% uh, or a 20% if you, just depending on what it is. But I've stopped using it all together. I use the insect netting, you get double double duty out of everything. Which is one of the things, any any tool I have here, it has to at least do two jobs or I don't. it's not useful. Mm -hmm. it, so let's talk a little about um, your hoops that you make okay. over here and how do you do that? 
Um, this, I got the hoop bender at Johnny's, and it's actually bolted up on the porch there. Mm -hmm. And it gives you several different hoops that you can bend. You don't need to use the bender from Johnny's. You can go to Lowe's and get a get a pipe bender. Mm -hmm. But I, I went ahead and got it while I was at it. Put it on the order. Um, these are, this is half inch conduit. Um, I don't recommend using anything for low tunnels other than conduit. You can use rebar, you can use PVC, but it doesn't have the rigidity. You're going to run into a lot of problems with it. Uh, the wind will flop it around. I've seen people run rebar through PVC, and that works okay. I, that's fine, but that's expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and once it's bent, it tends to flop around a lot. I like to have these where you can just, you just stick them in the ground. You're done. You can go on. You can rebar them in. That's fine. Uh, the ends, I tend to rebar a lot. This particular hoop does not do well in wind. It just, it just doesn't. This is a summertime hoop um, where you're running shade cloth, where you're not going to run into a lot of wind. Uh, the wind tends, for whatever reason, to pick these things up really hard. The only way to lock these down is to run purlins, which is the wood behind you. Mm -hmm. You run those purlins on them, mm -hmm. and I've got some set up over here, mm -hmm. and lock the plastic down over it and they're fine okay. they'll they'll hold these it's a little bit more expensive those cover two beds these cover one bed but these are not susceptible to the wind like those are you you don't even barely have to clamp the the plastic down to hold this in place um i've had i put purlins on them out there on those tomatoes we had gusts up to 42 miles an hour and it didn't move and what was the length what's the length of the pipe these are all 10 foot sticks of half inch conduit okay now, i also run three quarter inch conduit for these this is something i've built it gives you a uh, it's a trellis so you run a ridge pole across the top of it mm -hmm. it'll cover if you want to do two beds it just depends on it like i'll use netting coming down on both sides cover two beds and let like cucumbers or something crawl up mm -hmm. um, if you're going to string tomatoes you can string tomatoes on it if you want to run peas on it you can run your netting run netting down center run peas up it whatever you want to do it's incredibly useful these things anything that needs to run up a trellis they're very easy to put up i've got one set up one's halfway set up i generally tend to rebar these in just simply because I'm by myself, and when you put it in, it, it stands up. You don't have to worry about it falling over. Right. Um, they really don't need rebar, as far as that goes, because all the weight is pulling down on the center, so it's constantly reinforcing itself into the ground. Um, this is three-quarter because a lot of tomatoes we run, they'll get 10, 12, 15 feet tall, and they'll start running up and running down, and there's a lot of weight on them mm -hmm. by the time you get everything's said and done and that is that a 10 foot length too this is all 10 foot length it's okay. a standard 10 foot length that you can get okay lowe's home depot anywhere you want to get it it's um it takes nine of them per bed and you're paying about for three quarter you're paying about five dollars a stick and it takes two of them so you got ten dollars so you got ninety dollars in it okay per and, bed and the length of your bed again was 50 feet 50 feet okay yep. it's standardized on 50 foot beds so if you had 100 foot it'd be 18 18 okay uh actually 17 i think okay i think it would be 17 i think okay. you lose one there um because of the end you don't have that end there okay well let's go into the garden okay. and, and you tell us what you've got here that's a new planting of various different types of lettuce the trellis is all sickum cucumbers um, again we have more varieties different varieties of lettuce in through here uh, that is a, a panisse that's a mure and up on the end of it is a salanova butter these are bush cucumbers that made it through these been in the ground since march it was an experiment to see if they if i could actually do them in a low tunnel they survived everything, only had three drop. Um, they don't look the greatest right now, but from where they were just a week ago, I'm completely amazed. I thought I was gonna have to pull them up and just replant. Yeah. This is all cucumbers, um, different varieties. These, this is also a test. Once we get the uh, caterpillar tunnels in, we'll probably run these in caterpillar tunnels. So you've actually got supports. Do you do that all the time? These yes, the cross here? members are yep. called wind braces. Yep. And what they do is simply add structural integrity to it. Right. That's all they do. So if you take this, it's not going anywhere. Right. You do it on both ends, and with the ridge pole, it's all zip tied down. We use zip ties on everything. It's not going anywhere. It just these things are 
they're solid. They're not going anywhere for any reason unless the deer runs through them. Right. If deer runs through them, yeah, they'll tear them down. <laughs> and so. this is Hornova netting, or what do you what do you call that? I call it cucumber netting. Okay. That's what we call it. Okay. It's a plastic netting. I just got yep. it. Um, I don't know that I like this. I may go away from plastic on it. It's supposed to be UV stabilized. We'll see if it cuts the plants, which is what I'm worried about. Um, we did um, mong red cucumbers one year. Um, and we had them on a trellis, but they were strung. And we had, on a plant, we may have eight to nine, maybe 10 five pound cucumbers. Mm -hmm. And they got so heavy, they started sliding down the stream, no matter how, how much they tangled up around it. Okay. So I thought we'd try it here. We're also gonna run watermelons on this. We'll run uh, some getta squash on it. Um, anything that climbs, anything that can climb, anything that sprawls, we're gonna run on this. So how do you do a watermelon? I mean, in that? You train it. You just simply put it in the ground like that, train it up, and it'll go right up. We use two different kinds. I'm gonna use a black tail watermelon and a golden midget. And they don't get more than six pounds. I was gonna say, it doesn't pull as it As long as it doesn't get more than six pounds, we're okay. good. Okay. If it gets more than six pounds, it'll probably drop off and fall. Okay. But they're not supposed to. So we'll see. I like to try all the new stuff, and if I can find, there's a Japanese watermelon I've got in there too. Um, Kiko, Kido, something. And it doesn't get, it gets long. It's about that big around, got it out of Baker's. Um, we'll try those, see how they taste, let them run up. Mm -hmm. I want to do something, uh, some some kind of melons. Uh, we'll try some cantaloupe. I'm gonna put cantaloupe in this as well. Interesting. And get them up so we can keep it on the 50 foot bed instead of having everything sprawl. Right. I don't want to do anything that sprawls, it's a pain. <laughs> yeah. Now you don't have this under row, co uh, row cover. No, we. I pulled this up. Um, because I started noticing it like that when it's melting. Right. And I wanted to see what was going on with it. So I pulled it up and it's wild worms. Uh -huh. And that's what, that's, they're just cut worms. That's yeah. what they are. I've yeah. got it there, I've got them there. Um, so we're gonna have to do both these beds. So I pulled it up and said, okay, fine. This is already sold um, through Jones World's Market. Whatever's left, I'm gonna take it out and we're gonna treat it um, probably in the next couple of days. And as soon as that's sold out, I'll pull it up, we'll treat it kill those wild worms out of it and go right back down to put it right back down i don't have it only seems to be in these two beds okay so hopefully that's the end of it and then you have some small wire that you used here did this you just is cut a, the what's what is that this is a number nine agricultural wire right and you make these little little hoops like this it's great for the uh, insect netting right um if you put a lot of them in there they get really rigid you can put plastic over you can put agarbon over them, you can put anything you want over them so if you've only got a single row well mine are double rows and the, the tall ones you really don't want to put in here um, you can but these are convenient and they add to your hoop selection so if you don't have a whole lot of big metal hoops and you just need something to cover a few more beds you grab some throw them out there it's fine it works fantastic mm -hmm. i also use these inside of the um, of these tunnels when you use these hoops they have a tendency to be shallow on the sides right so you can see what that does it ah. extends that plastic out over it so that you're, it nothing's touching your leaves that's the thing about plastic you don't want it touching any part of your plant so when it gets cold I put these in on either side and it helps hold it out and give it a little bit more volume, a little bit more breathing room, a little bit more safety. We can run some Agrabon on top of these and then put poly over top of it. You're double insulated. Okay. So it helps a lot during the cold. Okay, so let's go back and look at that back there. Okay. And now these tomatoes, they were on a trellis like this, mm -hmm. but when the freeze came, they've been beat up. They've been in the ground since February and they have been absolutely beat up. Um, we had to take a trellis down. Um, deer had run through here and destroyed the trellis once and topped them all, so we saved all the tops out of them, waiting on suckers to come up, and we'll take this down, and I'll put another trellis up. But I think it sends a lot to uh, the uh, versatility of these things. We can just take a trellis down, cut it, rehang it, put a bar over it, cover it. We, put, we covered it with Agarbon. Um, then put poly over it, and then we take these, just lock it down. And it's it kept my alive. We're going to use them for seed tomatoes. Every one of them's a different variety. Um, and then uh, 
yeah, we'll just put all those in five gallon buckets, ferment them out, save the seeds, and we'll be good for next year. We've got some over here that are going in cages. Uh, they just got planted, actually. Um, they've not been out here very long. Um, we use the big cages here are uh, concrete reinforcement mesh. Mm -hmm. They've got uh, they've got four inch openings to them. Mm -hmm where you can get in here and do, and then we use the little cages. On this, I'm using the little cages right now to hold them up so I can get them in the ground, and then we'll put these. You just lift these things up and pop them in. Okay. Um, so you don't actually, and then in your insect, you don't actually have rock bags or anything. You're just using your clips. I, just use, I just use clamps on them. Okay. Yeah, I just use clamps on them. I've been through here several times. I've not seen any flea beetles on them. We see some kind of, but a lot of the damage and stuff in there is from the freeze. Right. This is all eggplant. Um, and so it's stunted right now, but it, it's starting to come back. Um, we'll see how it does. But I've got the other bed over here that needs to be covered. Um, we're going to put pyganic on it because I wasn't able to get it under insect netting quick enough mm -hmm. because of the rain. Mm -hmm. um, and it's already got a few on it. Mm -hmm. So we'll, pyganic is, a, is an organic uh, uh, pyrethrin. Mm -hmm. Uh, fairly expensive, but it really does number on flea beetles. It really takes care of them, and you get that through Johnny's. How do you store your, your covers when you take them up? I mean, over the winter, if you're not using them. I mean, do you roll them up? We How do rinse you... them and roll them up, and then I'll stick them in the, stick them in the garage. Okay. okay. We have several different ones we do. Uh, the standard being what, what I call a 310, and it's this one right here. You have, it's a universal. You can grow just about anything in it. Um, so you're going to go every 10 inches, you're going to put a hole in, three rows, and you're going to stagger as you go. So at this, when you mark your first row, you're going to come in between, in between, and then you're going to come back over on your last row and go through them. You can grow just about anything in them. It just depends on your ground. This ground is not the greatest, um, especially on this end. It's rained so much and packed hard. So as soon as these are sold out, we'll rip this up. This will get redone all together. We'll get probably two yards of compost on this. It needs it pretty bad. We've been, all this has compost on it, except for a couple of beds. And this will have to go back in. We'll have compost back on it. But these stay flat. We're not going to run raised beds on these at all anymore. That's the last raised bed I didn't get to um, because of the rain. And where do you get your compost? Uh, from Joe Hoffman. Joe Hoffman's? Yep. Okay. Hoffman's yep. composting? Okay. Yep. Uh, we get we get quite a bit from him. Um, we, when we first started, I think we got, uh, well, all of the front yard was completely covered in compost. Yep. He had to make a couple of trips down here with his dump trailer to get it here. Yep. Um, and what about, you don't have under irrigation under anything, do you? We don't run irrigation at all. We don't run drip irrigation. We'll probably never run drip irrigation. Drip irrigation in this model is a nuisance because if you're pulling beds up, you have to you have to disconnect it, move it out of the way, do what you're going to do with it, put it back down, and then cover it again. If we run irrigation, then I use overhead. And wobblers are the best. If you're, if you're going to start and you're going to run overhead, in this area it rains so much that disease pressure is already too high. Anyway, you're not, you're not helping yourself by doing drip. You're just not. Go ahead. You're, you're going to have to have some kind of antifungal, depending on what you're growing. If you're growing tomatoes, you're going to have to do it. Um, and that's, I just use Dr. Zyams on it. And use overhead. Overhead is inefficient as far as water, but you do two things at once. Mm -hmm. You water, and more importantly, you cool the plant down during the summer. That is more important than anything. They'll do fine with low amounts of water as long as you cool them down. So when the, the wobblers are low pressure. So you can run them off water, off your regular house water lines. It takes nine of them to completely cover this area. It's what it's gonna take. They have a rebar riser on it. You put PVC, zip tight to it. The wobbler head goes on top of it, and then you run a water line. That's all you do. You, you can put it on an automatic timer. It'll come on and do everything just nice. They don't go very far, um, and it's a finer droplet than what you would have in most setups. So you get kind, not a misting effect, but not an overly heavy effect either. It cools things down and it waters really well. Now with all this plastic I've got down, overhead is really, really inefficient. Um, so I'll take a lot of these row skirts up 
during the summer. And what's a row skirt? In case they don't know what that means in between. This is a row skirt. Okay. You'll see a lot of people that will buy this stuff and they'll put an entire sheet across the zone. Right. Okay, I don't do that because you can't rotate. If you do that, your rotation's done, you can't do it because you're always going to have to put that same thing back down. Mm -hmm. what you, you can spin it around, but it's still not going to be your center rows are going to be your center rows. Mm -hmm. So I do three foot. I, one of the things I wish I would have done is went to uh, four or six foot. That way I don't have to use the row skirts. I don't mm. have to cut them. It'll just roll right over. Right. Um, so any any further that we buy, that's what's gonna that's what's gonna happen. We'll go to five or six foot, whatever is available, and just let it roll over the sides of them, and then we don't have to cut these anymore. Okay. Let's talk about your tomatoes. Okay. All right. These. This is a big experiment. We ran we ran some last year. It took me about a year and a half to figure out how to grow these. These are treetop tomatoes. They don't grow like any indeterminate or bush top tomato I've ever grown, and I've been growing tomatoes since I was eight years old. Every Everything I did that I would normally do to a tomato plant killed them. Um, any kind of fertilizer kills them. They have no disease resistance whatsoever, none. So once I figured out how to grow these things. Last year I put in this row and they did really, really well. They did surprisingly well at this density. We tried them first in five gallon pots. I had plenty of tomatoes on the plants. They only get about this tall, but they will produce all season long. If you're a small farmer, this is not a bad option as long as you can keep up with the disease on it. Okay. You absolutely have to be vigilant. If you don't, they're going to die. They simply will die. Um, so far, they've done really, really well. Um, I expect a minimum average of a half a pound per plant per week, which will give me 350 pounds. Realistically, I expect to see a pound of plant per week, mm -hmm. which is going to give me about 700 pounds a week. Mm -hmm. um, if you can do this, uh, small farms can easily keep up with little to no uh, infrastructure. You don't have to trellis these things. You don't. You absolutely don't sucker them. That's where all your fruit comes from. There's nothing to do with them. They'll stand up on their own. You may have to run, um, like right here. I, that's why I've left this up. I may run a string through here to help hold the sides up once they start bearing fruit. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I don't. I don't want to do much more than that to it. Mm. Um, the densities, if you put a five gallon bucket over this, they have more room than a five gallon bucket. And a five gallon bucket, I got them about that tall, about that wide, and just absolutely full of tomatoes. So this is a big production experiment on it to see if it'll work. Um, we did this density last year, they did fantastic. This is an upward, there's a hundred in this row, in this bed, 80 in this bed, and a hundred in each of these other beds. And what's the spacing? The spacing is actually 18 inches, 33 oh. per row. It's a 318. Okay. So you got three rows, 18 inches apart. They will absolutely fill that up. This will be a green mass by the time it's done. Um, we'll see how the disease works on it. Um, Alternaria, blight, early blight, late blight. Um, they're all going to get this fusarium. Make sure your ground's good. You have to check them. If you get fusarium on these, they're dead. The trick to doing this is, is you pre-treat all your seeds. When you put your seeds in, is use a product called Root Shield. Now, I bottom water on my on my trays, so I mix Root Shield, and I, from the day one I put them in there, they've got Root Shield coming up on them. Mm -hmm. And what Root Shield is, is a non-segmented roundworm that attaches to the roots of the plants, and it'll eat fusarium, it'll eat all these bad things that are in there. Mm -hmm. It runs up to 12 weeks, so I'm going to give them one more application here in a little while, um, and I'll just simply spray the hole real good, and then I'm done. They'll they'll be they should be really good by then. I want to let the roots get a little bit bigger, um, and we pre-treated. Um, I took a gallon jug and a five-gallon bucket, and kept as I was planting. I treated the hole as I went in. Mm -hmm. So we've got they'll be fully grown, ready to produce before I ever have to go back in and, and retreat on them. And if they don't need it, then I'm not going to. We'll just we we'll play that by ear. Um, here we had uh, the low tunnel malfunction. I think we had a hole in the plastic, and it allowed water in, and it froze. But I had enough spares to replace everything, 
So those are going to be replanting. Uh, but overall, I'm really happy we've got 12 different varieties in here. We'll be trialing them all, getting seed off of them. Uh, I want them to get a little bit of disease, a little bit, so that I can start building disease resistance out of them. And then every year it's going to get a little easier and a little easier and a little easier. Um, so you started in 2018? Yes. So you've only been doing this two years? Two years, yes. This is pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So let's talk about your markets. Okay. Uh, We'll end up here with where do you you know sell? We don't want to know your secrets, but what what's your best outlet? Do you use? I use predominantly markets. Uh, um, I've got one contract in Boone where I sell quite a bit, um, but right now it's shut down. The markets I like. Uh, we like Jonesboro a lot. Um, they like the lettuce that we do. We do a lot of lettuce in Jonesboro. They like the tomatoes. Um, John City on occasion, I think we'll do John City this year. It looks like uh, John's World's going to stay online, which frees us up to do another Saturday market, so we'll do Johnson City's. Um, we're scheduled to go down to John City in June. I just don't know when. It's just going to be based on when everything's ready. Mm -hmm. um, we, do, we did do Bristol. I ran into a problem with Bristol in that the side they've got me on is as the sun rises it's really hitting us mm -hmm. and lettuce really really does not like that i mean i can put you know shade around the rest of the market stall but one side's going to have to be open right and the open side is always facing the sun they really couldn't get me where i needed to so i went to abingdon and i was actually going to start in abingdon this year mm -hmm. um since they run year round which is what i really need i need a year-round market um but they shut down due to COVID. Mm -hmm. Everybody shut down due to COVID, so I backed off in March. It's like, okay, I don't even know if it's going to be a spring market. I don't even know when they're going to open. It, there was no, so I stopped seeding, which turned out to be a mistake. Um, but it is what it is, and we're back on track now. We'll be ready by June. Everything will be going in and around. I've got uh, 2,000 head of lettuce that are going to go in. Um, another 300 tomato plants has got to go in. Um, so lettuce and tomatoes seem to be a big staple for you. They are. Lettuce and tomatoes are a big staple. That's it's what sells the most. I, I started out doing a lot of uh, a lot of different stuff just to see what sells. Because all this came out of my pocket, I need to get it back in my pocket. So I'm looking at predominantly what I can sell, what will move, what I can make the most money off of. And when it comes down to this, it, it comes down to two two things. You can either have a whole lot of variety, but a little of each. Since we're a small market garden. You're not going to, you can't do a whole lot of volume, which is the thing with the tomatoes we can actually do with this type of, we can do volume on it. We can do volume on lettuce because we get anywhere from 180 head to 400 head per bed. So if I'm doing Salanovas, I can get 400 and I do three beds of that and that's 1200. That, that moves quite a bit and I can move quite a bit of it. Problem is now a lot of people are doing lettuces. The market's kind of draining out. Yep. Um, but yeah, we do a lot of lettuce tomato. We we started doing a lot of the, uh, a lot of everything. We did leeks and and just all kinds of different stuff, and we just couldn't keep up with volume. They'd, everybody want more of the same thing. It's like, well, I'm out of room. I can't do much more. So I said, okay, if you want volume, then we'll just narrow down our selection and do a whole lot more of those. So as you're picking through, okay, what makes money? Lettuce tomato. That's what makes money. Okay. Do you actually use the wobbler over here too? Wobbler, yeah. Yeah, on the just, tomatoes? On the tomatoes, absolutely. We'll overhead water tomatoes. It rains here incessantly until the end of July. Right. On a normal on a normal year. August, it starts drying out. September's murderous hot. September's the hottest month of the year, so that's when I put the wobblers over here. I'm looking to cool. It evaporates this just immediately. And I'll go up on my antifungal. We just watch it. We'll go up on it, but really there's no need. I've never had a problem with it. Once it hits August and September, and even in October, the air is dry enough mm -hmm. where you don't have all that incessant humidity. Humidity is what causes it. Right. Um, if you get rid of the humidity, your disease pressure goes way down. Mm -hmm. And where we're at right now with this creek, we've got forest service land there. It's the mountains. We get an east wind in the morning. The humidity here, I would pit it against any tropical place on earth. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. I've got an ice vest that I wear all through July. Okay. Um, just to stay upright in it. <laughs>
So tell us an ending here. What would you not do? You've, you've been here for two years. You're doing an amazing job. But what would you not do again when you first started now that you've been in your second year? What would I not do? Well, um, have, have you been pleased with everything you did? No, definitely not pleased with everything I've done. Um, I would not. Um, I would not invest so heavily in some of the cool toys I got. They look good. I saw people using them. Mm -hmm. They looked useful, but I come from an IT background. And it's like, no, I should have never gotten that. Right. Um, one of the cedars I got, I should have never gotten it. Um, the BCS was a really good investment. I would not have invested in um, the uh, three mil plastic. I would go with six mil plastic. I got the three mil plastic because thinking, okay, I'm one person. It's going to be a whole lot lighter, a whole lot easier to do. To work with and that's true but you look at it wrong and it gets a hole in it so yeah I should have done that I wish I'd have went ahead and got spent the money and got a greenhouse first to me a nursery somewhere where you can do starts is the most important thing you can do you can wiggle around everything else but you cannot get around that if you if I have problems it's always in the nursery it's about timing where I don't it's not big enough I don't have enough room it's getting too hot it's getting too cold to me, that's, that's where it's at. Unless you want to buy your starts. If you want to buy your starts, like at Banner Greenhouse or whatever, you can do that. But that's not me. I would also, uh, I think I would have started, I would have given myself a year before I ever started going to the market and just prepped the ground for a solid year. Okay. And I gave myself three, maybe four months is what I ended up initially having, and it just wasn't enough. Okay. Uh, there was too much that needed to be done here, and you really don't know until you get into it. Mm -hmm. um, like this over here, you can see the rocks. Mm -hmm. If I to go through these beds, I would go maybe I don't know to right there and have a five-gallon bucket full of rocks, yeah. take and dump it, and keep going. And then you till it, and you got to start all over again. Yeah. And it took months to get this to where it was plantable. Okay. Well, Chris, this has been great to be here, and uh, we will be talking. You'll be on us online when we go through this. But thank you so much. You've done an amazing job for thank two you years. Guys. Thank you. Two thank years. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, some are better than other. A lot of them are little small cherry tomatoes. Um, I stuck with the big slicer kind, um, as big as they'll get. And a lot of the size depends on the amount of water and what, how, you, how you prep your ground. If you prep your ground right, you can really get a lot out of them. If you get a lot of tomatoes, they'll generally be smaller. So you kind of got to watch your sets on them. Some of these varieties I'll throw away. We won't ever plant them again. Some of them we'll keep. We'll just have to see what happens uh, once they start bearing fruit, where they land, how they taste. Uh, taste is going to be more important than anything. Uh, if they don't taste good, they're not going in. Um, so you had somebody ask again about your conduit. I believe you said you use your half inch conduit for the hoops and your three fourths inch for your trellises. That's correct. Yeah, the half inch is much easier to work with. It's a whole lot lighter. You don't really need it to carry a lot of weight. Um, you can run a ridge pole across them if you want to, but if I'm going to run a ridge pole, then I'm going to run a trellis. Um, there are certain things, I guess, you could run a ridge pole across it. It doesn't really add structural strength. If you want to add, uh, if you're having problems with low tunnels, let's say you set up a tunnel and um, you've got your cover over it, and no matter what, how you clamp it down, the plastic or whatever cover you use is coming off of it, take some more hoops, and after you've got your cover on, go in between the ones that are already there and put it over the cover. This works the same as a caterpillar tunnel, where a caterpillar tunnel uses a shoestring method. If you just simply put the hoops over and shove them in the ground, you get the exact same effect. So, and that in and of itself will really, uh, really help. If you're having problems with the How plastic going around. Um, how long does it take you to make hoops? I mean, you're probably pretty good at it now. Um, I made them all at once, so I don't really remember. Um, it takes just a second with that hoop bender. It's nothing. You have to measure out. You have to make a couple of measurements on it, mark it with uh, a Sharpie, and you bend it. But after you do that a few times, you can kind of eyeball it and get it close enough. Except okay. with, uh, with the really high-sided ones, the single row hoops, those you definitely have to measure out. All right. Um, you said that uh, on your insect netting, how long does that last? Oh, of course, you've only been doing this two years, but... Um. Yeah, I've not had any problem. With the, uh, the flea beetle netting will not last long. It rips really easy. You have to be really gentle with it, and after it gets in some wind, or maybe you step on it or something, if you step on it, it'll rip it. Um, as long as you don't rip it, it'll last at least somewhere between three and five years. Um, the heavier stuff I have, I would expect that stuff to go a minimum of five years. It's just really heavy duty stuff. So it's worth experience. Okay. Are there other questions from people out there? If not, I'll keep asking them. Does anybody want to ask a question out loud? <laughs> uh, there's one here. What do I do about deer? Um, that's why I want this outside um, so I could show you. I take the hoops, the, the lower hoops, and I build a fence around it and then I'll take like Agrabon and or insect netting whatever I've got handy and lay over top of it and it makes a little wall. Inside I'll run I'll just put the hoops in and the deer won't go in. They'll keep out of it because it's too much of, of a trouble to get in there. I've got a couple of plants where they've walked by and snipped. They snipped the top out of it. That'll go away. Uh, the only thing they really mess with are tomatoes right now. Everything else they don't mess with. And what about birds? Here. What about birds or groundhogs? <laughs> uh, the groundhogs, the dogs usually take care of. Um, I've had uh, earlier this season, um, I set uh, 15 trays out to harden off and I went to pick my son up. I came back two hours later and there was a groundhog sitting on the deck and he had wiped out 10 of the trays sitting there having him a big old salad. So <laughs> uh, we got rid of him. We, we, put a, we put a live trap out and got rid of it. And then we got, um, Birds, there's not much you can do about birds. I mean, really, you can put, you can put your crops under shade, shade cloth. It helps some, um, but not completely. If we have, especially with tomatoes, if we find any, any, any kind of bird uh, excrement on it, it gets thrown away immediately. I don't even bother washing it. I don't do nothing. It just gets thrown away. Um, so you just got to keep an eye out for it. So someone did ask on your conduit, you know, how do you keep the wind from just destroying it? Is that just the bay where you have them pushed in the ground or? No, it, it depends. Okay. Um, with, the, with the two bed style, what I'll do is if I know, like if we're going in and I'm going to overwinter something and I want to put a cover over it, 
I'm going to rebar them in, just the end pieces. I don't need the center pieces rebarred in, just the end pieces. Then I'm going to run a wind brace on the two end pieces. So there'll be a straight piece of conduit that zip ties to that end, it's shoved in the ground on both ends. If you don't do this, what's going to happen is, even if you're rebarred in, even if you rebarred everything in, it's going to start to literally act like a caterpillar, and it's going to walk that plastic back and forth. And when it does, it walks the it walks it off the rebar, so it doesn't matter. Eventually, the wind will get up under it, and it'll just blow it away. So to stop that, you when you, you put purlins on it, that's that's the best thing to do. You put purlins on it, and that will hold it up to 40 miles an hour. If you want to really help it, then go ahead and put the hoops, the external hoops on to help hold that plastic steel. But normally if you put purlins on it, you don't have to fool with it. If you don't have time to put purlins on it, then put those hoops over on the outside of it once you have your cover on, and that will help tremendously. So you've only been there two years. Um, how are you gonna rotate? Are you always gonna have your tomatoes there? Or you know, what will you do about disease pressure that comes worse if you keep the something good thing like about The good thing about uh, those pre-type tomatoes is, is because I can run them in a bed like that, assuming this works, and that's, we'll just keep that in mind, assuming it works, then I'll just simply rotate them out. We've got four zones and we'll just rotate the zones around. Okay. Next year they'll go to that lower zone, and then next year they'll move up to where I had the, the trellis and the, the lettuce, and then it'll move into that upper bed, and we'll just rotate everything around. So, uh if you, if you all have other questions, you can type them in or, or we can ask them. What do you like to grow? <laughs> <laughs> um, I do like, I grow lettuce and tomatoes. That's what I like. I like cucumbers. I like to grow cucumbers a lot. Um, I like to grow eggplant a lot when I can get away from flea beetles. Um, eggplant grows really well here and uh, really early sometimes if I can keep it from freezing. Um, again, depending on the variety. Um, I do, I like to do a little red Russian kale. I like it quite a bit. Unfortunately, there's not a big market for it. I like kale straight up. I love to run kale. Um, Lacinato, now that we have the insect netting, it really makes life a whole lot easier. You can run Lacinato without it being eaten to death and having to go out there and spray it down. <laughs> um, the insect netting takes care of that. Um, spinach, we do, I like to grow spinach a lot. Uh, it grows really well here and really fast. Um, I don't like to do beans. Uh, there's too much labor involved for one person um, to get a decent amount. I mean, people buy them by the bag fulls. I don't want to spend three hours out there picking. Um, tomatoes, of course. Uh, tomatoes are my favorite thing to grow. Um, I've been growing them since I was a kid, and I, we do pretty good with them. We'll start. I actually start a breeding program. I want to introduce some new some new breeds next year. Uh, once we get our new nursery in, I'll have room to do it, and, and uh, we'll start mixing in some of uh, Bradgate stuff with some of the competition tomatoes I have. To get some great big tasty ones. So we have one last question, and then uh, we will add your contact information uh, when we send out to the people who have registered today. But you pretty much grow lettuce year round, right? All year yeah. long. All year long. Yeah. Uh, January is about the only time. And that's because I need a break, <laughs> pretty much. But if, if somebody calls and says, hey, I need lettuce in January, I'll grow it. It's not a problem. And we're, we're normally, you, you grow it right up until uh, the end of December. You put a bunch in, you let it coast through January because nothing moves in January. Um, if we have, a, if we have a, a regular winter, if we have a warm winter, yeah, it'll, it'll move quite, quite well. Um, and then starting in February, new starts will go in. We'll do kales in February. We'll do spinach. Uh, all the greens start going in the ground in February. They grow really slow, and we just cover them in a tunnel and let them stay there. And when they're, when they're done, we'll start taking them to market, which is normally around March, April. And, and since you're on a creek bottom, you don't have to use irrigation in the winter, so you don't have to worry about freezing, right? I mean, No, no, uh, absolutely not. You don't want to water much in the winter anyway. You want to get away from that and you want to water as little as possible in the winter. Um, and it's not necessarily for, uh, most of it's for freezing. It just doesn't need it because stuff is not growing well. It's not growing as fast, so it doesn't need as much. So you, you have to be really careful about overwatering, you know, or otherwise you'll, you'll start getting some, some bad stuff showing up in the ground. So we don't, I don't water at all during the winter. 
None. And do you have a problem with slugs? And if so, how do you take care of that? Somebody wants to Slugo. know. Slugo. It's iron phosphate, which is slow is the name brand of it. You can pick it up anywhere. Um, sprinkle it in, till it in, it, it'll, it'll generally knock them out. And no, we don't have a whole lot. Uh, I've seen some snail pressure every now and then, um, but not much. I'll find one or two heads. The biggest problem we have on lettuce is aphids. Aphids are a much bigger problem than snails. Um, aphids are really, this year has been the worst year I've ever seen for them. They're everywhere this year. Um, so we're getting out the dish soap and the neem oil and hitting that pretty good. They're, they're, pretty, they're pretty rough this year. Okay. And then do you ever use cro uh, cover crops or are you mainly just putting uh, compost down? No, 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 no. I don't use cover crops at all yet. Um, I've got a bunch of cover crop seed, but I find it <sighs> green manures. If you've got the time, if you've got the equipment to do it efficiently, then they're fantastic. Um, I don't. So what I do is I, I build a lot of my own fertilizers from a book called The Ideal Soil. Um, and it, once you get a, a good soil test and a really good uh, soil test, you can go through and say, okay, I need this, 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 and this. And, and you'll buy like, shales and different minerals and put those minerals in, um, your calciums, your magnesiums, um, all these different products, and you mix them together and put it in there and I can get by without it. Green manures, in certain cases, they're okay. To me, it's just more weed pressure. Um, that's what it ultimately ends up for me to be. Uh, I don't have the time to let it, uh, when it, like when you till it back into the ground, you get it back in there, I don't want to, you have to cover it. Uh, in the spring, that takes a tremendous long time. I want, if, if I do it, I'm gonna do it in the summer. I want something where it's warm, and it will decompose. Your bacteria in your ground don't start really getting active until it's about 52.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So if it's below that, you have no bacterial movement anyway. So if, you, if it's in there, it's, nothing's happening. You're gonna have to heat it somewhere. So I would have to drag out heat cables, then cover it and let it cook. So yeah, I could, but no, it's, it's kind of inefficient for me. That doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It doesn't mean it's inefficient for someone else, but for me, it is. Well, then uh, you said you, what, 5,000 square feet is what you find? A little said. over you that, yeah, 1250, 1250 per zone times four. So yeah, about 5,000 square feet, about that. And, you, and as we sign off here for with you, you're getting ready to build a greenhouse. What size greenhouse are you building? It's gonna be 20 by 50. Um, and mm -hmm. we'll, we'll use a cat tunnel as the frame for it, but I'm gonna in-wall both ends in and we're gonna purlin it down. I'm not gonna use the shoestring. Well, I might. I might leave that shoestring on there. Um, and then I won't put heating and cooling in there. I'm going to try and really nail it down. I want it to stay a certain temperature all the time, unless, depending on whatever, whatever I'm starting. All right. Well, Chris, thank you so much. Um, as I said, in two years, that's pretty amazing. And, and he is known for his lettuce and tomatoes in this area. So we want to thank you for being so willing to share with everybody. And we'll have your contact information and this video will be on YouTube uh, if you want to look at it again and see some of the great tools. I did want to ask that orange tool that you said or tiller that you said brought the rocks up. You didn't say what that was, what kind it was. Um, you know, I don't remember either. I think it is a, uh, oh, it's just a little Lowe's brand there. It's well known and I can't remember it right now. Uh, what is it? Husqvarna, that's what it is. Husqvarna. Okay. It, it, it's a counter rotating. Okay. That's the green thing. It's, it's counter rotating. And a forward time tiller tends to drive rocks down and ride over them, where counter rotating kicks them up and it's a whole lot easier to get them up because I don't, I don't want a rock bed under the dirt. I want to get the rocks out. So it's really okay. handy. All right. So thank you so much. And we appreciate your time both the day we visited and tonight. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. So our next speaker is Adam Watson, and Adam is our extension agent, uh, fairly new here in Washington County. So Adam, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself, and I see you've got your uh, coronavirus beard now. Exactly. It's grown <laughs> in nicely, so 
took put good, put took my time to good use when I was away from everybody, so they didn't see me scraggly. Um, but thank you for the introduction, Dana. So I've been with Washington County Extension Office less than a year. Uh, not new to Extension, right out of college. I actually in Kentucky worked in Extension, then worked with Kentucky Department of Agriculture uh, for about seven years, and I most recently came from Appalachian Harvest, the food hub of Appalachian Sustainable Development up in Virginia. Some of you all may be familiar with them. Uh, and so my background is in commercial horticulture, specifically vegetables, and I've been dealing with on-farm produce safety really since uh, about 2010. Uh, so I've got to see a lot of changes and transitions. And I'll just mention, Chris, I loved your comment about the tomato and the bird droppings. That was exactly the right answer. So right <laughs> on. <laughs> it, it, it did my heart well to hear you uh, say that. So it is telling me that the host has disabled the screen sharing. So we may need to do some clicks to get that going on this end. You might need to make him a host. Can you do that? Uh, Rosie. Yeah, I just have to change the settings. Okay. And, and real briefly, while we're waiting for that, I'll just mention that uh, what we're covering tonight, um, we're going to talk about FISMA real quick up front and then talk about GAP. I kind of changed the order from the way I traditionally do it because in case we have some people that have to drop off, I'd love for you to get FISMA at least half a GAP rather than all of GAP and no FISMA. So it's a little bit different order than I normally do it. So it may not piece together as well as I hope it will, but I think it'll still be useful. And in full honesty, either one of these topics, we could spend three hours on and still not exhaust it. So this is going to be a uh, sort of cursory overview, uh, but I think it will still be valuable to us. So real quick here. Now, are you all seeing the presentation or the notes? Please let me see the presentation. Okay, good. Because uh, sometimes I have to do some clicks on this end to get it going the other way. So, uh, as I said, I'm with Washington County Extension, and I'll mention especially uh, on this topic, because I have a lot of knowledge that I bring to Extension with this, I probably know more than a lot of the folks in our general region. So even if you're not in Washington County, and particularly on this topic, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. Uh, if I were to do a farm visit with you or something like that, I may involve your county agent or at least ask them if they'd like to be involved just to be respectful of them but don't think just because I'm with Washington County that I'm not available to you so uh, please feel free to reach out to me. So to start with our journey on food safety we're going to look at the Food Safety Modernization Act and this really was a big deal within the food safety world. This was probably the largest change since the FDA was created back in the early 1900s uh, and what it did was grant a number of new uh, regulatory authorities to the FDA. It gave them powers that they previously didn't have. Believe it or not, previously they could not force companies to recall product if they discovered a problem during their inspections and things like that. All they could do was sort of, you know, inform the company they should do it, but they didn't literally have mandatory recall authority. So even some things like that that might surprise us, FDA couldn't do prior to this. And the Food Safety Modernization Act is itself a large piece of regulatory framework. We are only going to look at one small part of that, uh, and that's the produce safety rule, or at least that's how we refer to it. In truth, it's part 112 standards for the growing, harvesting, packing, and holding of produce for human consumption but it's a lot easier to say produce safety rules. So that's what we'll stick with. And so basically with most federal regulations, there's often carve outs for the smallest producers that would be affected uh, by the rule, the smallest entities. And with FISMA, the produce safety rule, we see the same exact thing. So to begin with, who does this rule not apply to? In their language, they say a not covered farm. And so, if you're selling produce and it is looking at the value of produce sold, as long as on a three year average, your annual sales are less than $25,000, you are not covered. So that means this doesn't apply to you. So especially for a lot of beginning operations, this is true. And luckily that 25,000 figure, which actually dates to 2011 is inflation adjusted. So the three year average value for 17, 18, 19 is actually $28,075. 
Now, I will mention this. If you are beginning, and let's say you start off with a really good running start and you make $50,000 that first year, you better be prepared that you're going to have to now be covered by FISMA. They don't allow you to factor in zeros for years that you weren't in operation. So if you do have a bang out year and you do great, uh, that may get you uh, started on having to look at what do I need to do under FISMA sooner rather than later. There's also another category that reduces much of what you might have to do, and that's called the qualified exemption. And it actually looks at a different metric. So the first one was produce sales. Very straightforward. We know what produce sales is. Qualified exemption looks at the annual monetary value of all food sold. Now, this work starts getting complicated because food is not just produce. Uh, and there's also some uh, other complicating factors in there about who is buying it as well as where they're at. And so we'll just move forward. And this is a value of $500,000. Again, gross sales, which sounds like a huge number, especially if you're a small beginning producer. But when you look at small family farms, where oftentimes there may be two or three households involved in that farm, $500,000 worth of sales on a gross standpoint is not inconceivable in our region. Uh, certainly, we have some cattle and row crop operations, forage operations that are definitely probably topping out when you look at there's multiple households being supported on a gross sales standpoint. Uh, so it may look like a ginormous number, but it may actually catch some people depending on how their operations are set up. But let's take this apart and look at it a little more in detail. So again, all food sold, not just produce. So that would include sales of animals sales of grains, sales of forages. Even the food for animals falls under the category of all food. Uh, so be aware of that if you happen to produce hay or things of that nature. And again, that inflation adjusted value, $561,494. But it gets more complicated than just that threshold of income. There is an and there. And if you're used to federal regulations, you know anytime there's an and, that means there's something else that goes along with it. And this something else, is stated as being sales to qualified end users during such period exceed the average annual monetary value of food sold to all other buyers. So what in the world are they trying to say with that? What they're basically saying is your gross sales must be greater than 50% to the qualified end user. Okay, now the question, who's the qualified end user? That is typically in most small farm uh, circumstances, the consumer of the food. So if you're selling off the farm at farmer's markets, you have a CSA, you have an on-farm stand, those sorts of things, that's direct to the consumer. Very straightforward. But it also includes if you're selling directly to restaurants or directly to grocery stores even. If you're making delivery to the store, then you are selling to a qualified end user. So basically what this is, is if a majority of your gross sales are going to the end user, they identify with you directly, that you're working with them one-on-one -on -one essentially, then you're still good. But there is another and to this requirement to reach this qualified exemption. And that's where those sales occur. So that qualified end user has to be located within the same state or Indian reservation or not more than 275 miles away. So to sum this up, a qualified exempt operation, which removes a lot of the burden of the Food Safety Modernization Act Produce Safety Rule has a income limit average over the three years of $561,000 plus dollars and 50% of the gross sales are to qualified end users that are located in the same state or within 275 miles. So there are a lot of producers who are making above that lowest number, that, that $25,000 inflation adjusted number, but who still meet this requirement because the majority of their sales are to qualified end users. So uh, this is important because as a qualified exempt, you do have to do some things under FISMA. So one of the big ones is you have to disclose the name and complete business address of the farm where the produce was grown at on either the label of the produce or at the point of purchase. Obviously, a lot of produce is not sold with a label, particularly if we're talking direct to a consumer. 
Uh, so what we can do to meet this is at the farmer's market. If we have signage with our farm name on it, all we have to do is add in that business address. If we have um, labels that we apply to boxes that maybe we're selling direct to restaurants or to uh, grocery stores, we would want to include that address. So this isn't too onerous to meet. There's an additional requirement of some records you have to keep as a qualified exempt operation but it's fairly straightforward. Uh, they're not two owners. One, you have to have records that demonstrate your farm satisfies for the qualified exemption, and that is to have a record showing that annually you review your sales, you do that calculation, and you verify the farm's continued eligibility. So in and of itself, a qualified exemption removes most of the requirements of FSMA, but there are still a few things. There's one thing I do want you to make aware of. If you were to be a fully covered farm, which I think is possible depending on your exact setup, but again, if you're meeting the qualified end user requirement of greater than 50% of gross sales, you would be okay most likely for most operations in our area. But if you were to be fully covered, there is a requirement that at least one supervisor or responsible party for your farm as they say, uh, completes a training that is recognized by FDA as being adequate. There's only one training that they recognize, that's the Produce Safety Alliance training or the grower training course. Uh, it comes with a small fee. Uh, I know in Tennessee, University of Tennessee Extension has helped put these on. Uh, they've received funding through specialty crop block grants. Um, and I encourage growers to go ahead and do this, even if they don't have to. In part, it just gives you an idea of what may become uh, a requirement for you if you were to change how you're marketing, if maybe you shift more to wholesale. And so it just keeps you informed. So certainly I think there's some options that even if you're not required, it's a good idea to do this. Uh, with COVID, of course, um, we don't have anything scheduled right now in the state that I'm aware of. There are some online options and I'll be sending you some uh, link of ring sources and it'll have the Produce Safety Alliance grower training information on there. I don't think it's something where you have to go immediately and take that training if you have it today. Uh, I think the in-person training is probably a little bit better. Um, I think online while a good substitute doesn't, uh, maybe doesn't have all the quality of a in-person training, uh, but uh, certainly just be aware of that. And I know that was real quick uh, and uh, probably not real clear about FSMA, but again, for most producers in our region, it's not gonna be a huge impact. I still encourage you to look at doing the Produce Safety Alliance grower training because I do think there's some value in knowing what is in uh, FSMA. And quite honestly, not everything about FSMA is even decided yet. So one of the larger portions of the rule deals with water use uh, within the production of crops. And there's still a lot of questions with that. They have not come out with a finalized version uh, that details everything. Uh, and so there's still questions on Food Safety Modernization Act, even though it was signed into law in 2011. It's a highly complicated task that they're having to deal with. Uh, and so it's still evolving. So definitely it's something to keep on your radar, uh, but keep in mind what options you have for marketing and what your economic thresholds are. So moving on to GAP, and of course today at this moment, you may not know what GAP is, but in a minute we'll explain what that is. So this is where I normally start a conversation like this. It's, you know, why are we worried about food safety and produce? Why do we worry as farmers about it? Well, quite simply because there, there is a concern. So CDC estimates that one in six Americans are actually each year um, a subject or victim of foodborne illness. Uh, up to 28,000 are hospitalized and 3,000 die of foodborne illness. Now this is all foodborne illnesses, not merely produce foodborne illnesses. Uh, but certainly that, that's concerning. Um, we're concerned about it because we don't want situations like this to happen. So back in 2006, some of you may remember the spinach outbreak. And while it's great to reaffirm the ideal of a higher power for kids, we probably don't want to do it through unsafe produce. Uh, so trying to inject a little bit of humor in there. But definitely it's a subject that is a concern to us. Produce contributes to those foodborne illnesses in part because of how we use it. So if we think about fresh fruits and vegetables, often we eat those uncooked. 
So now if we had a cooking step, we would have what's called a kill step. We have the ability to heat the product to a high enough temperature that it actually kills that pathogen. With a lot of produce, the way we consume it, it doesn't happen. So that means if there is a problem, we don't really have a curative approach to it. There's nothing we can do. I think it is important to say that it's not that we have a systemic problem within uh, the food industry in the US. We have a safe system. Farmers do a good job of producing safe food, but it is something that we have to be intentional with. We can't be too lax with it because the problem is when there is a problem with food safety, it's serious. We're typically talking about the loss of life. Um, but the reality is oftentimes for healthy populations, we might not have such a serious outcome. So let me ask you a question. How many of y'all have ever had the stomach flu or a 24 hour bug or, or something like that? If you think about what symptoms you had, you had intestinal distresses, diarrhea, vomiting, maybe fever, cramps. Could it have been a foodborne illness? Absolutely. All those symptoms are exactly the symptoms of foodborne illnesses that we may be more familiar with, like Salmonella, E. coli, uh, Camelobacter, Listeria. Uh, so when we think of having the stomach flu, there really isn't a stomach flu. There isn't a 24-hour bug. Most likely when we have those sort of episodes, that's that foodborne illness. So that's where that one in six number comes from. For healthy individuals, especially adults, foodborne illness is not that huge of a concern. But the danger becomes we as producers do not have control over who eats our product. Even if we know who is buying it, we don't know who they may be sharing the meal with. So, you know, the oldest, the youngest, and those that are somehow immunocompromised are at highest risk. So while a healthy adult may just experience, uh, you know, a little bit of time spent in the bathroom, that same episode could kill one of those more highly um, susceptible populations. And that's why it's such a serious matter. So what GAP is, is good agricultural practices. I personally think that's a horrible name for it because it's so general. It doesn't give you any idea about what's it really about. But to clarify, it's a best practices approach to minimize the risk of microbial contamination of produce as it moves through the supply chain from the farm to the fork. Uh, so it's a way to actually intensively and purposely produce food that has less of a risk to it. It's based ultimately on a 1998 FDA document. It's not anything new. And the reason this document came about, this guidance, again, and guidance is not regulatory effect, it's not law. Guidance was issued because they said, if we're having foodborne illness related to produce, the only way we can deal with it is preventively. So let's go to the source, to the farm, to producers, and try to come up with methodologies that would prevent foodborne illness in the first place, rather than just responding to outbreaks when they happen. GAP certification is another term you may have heard. And what GAP certification is, it is a third party verification that a farm has in place a GAP program and they are following it. Third party verification is where a party that is disinterested from the transaction. So for instance, if I'm buying a farm's tomatoes, I'm not a third party because I have an interest. If I'm supposed to inspect that farm from a gap standpoint, I have a conflict of interest that I really have people needing to buy those tomatoes. So maybe I would let something slide or, you know, not pay attention to something that was negative because I had to have tomatoes for my business. So that third party is disinterested. They're going to get paid for the service. It doesn't matter if they pass you or fail you. Uh, and so that's why it's the system that's set up. Uh, there are both private as well as uh, USDA that offers GAP certification services. Uh, one thing to stress here, GAP, unlike FISMA, is not, is not a regulation. So it's a market requirement. And what I mean by that is certification is only required in the event your buyer is asking for it. So if you're typically selling to grocery stores, restaurant chains, or large food service companies, they may ask you for a GAP certificate. Uh, this is the conversation hopefully you have before the season starts so you can prepare to do this. Um, 
but the short answer is, do I need to have GAP certification? Only if the people that write your checks for your produce ask for it, do you need it? Now, I don't want to say we shouldn't be following GAP practices. GAP practices should be followed by all producers, regardless of what your market is. One, they're science-based protocols, and they are engaged to reduce the chance of microbial contamination. There isn't a producer anywhere that will not benefit from using GAP practices. Because again, it's intentional and it's formulated to create a product that is safer for your consumers. A sort of short list of how we do GAP on the farm. We look at identifying sources of microbes. Then we look at how those microbes can move on the farm. We implement practices to prevent those movements. We plan corrective actions to address concerns or failures, and then we monitor and document our actions. And so we'll go through each of these this evening. When we're talking about these microorganisms, we're talking about bacteria, we're talking about viruses, we're talking about parasites. By and large, bacteria are probably the most common, uh, although viruses such as norovirus are very common with foodborne illness. And, and occasionally parasites uh, such as cyclospora can be leaked to produce. Uh, but we don't have to be an expert on these bacteria and viruses uh, because essentially our actions are based on the farm. We're not focusing in on the potential uh, microorganism. Contamination occurs a produce in part because of how it's produced. It's grown in the open environment and even in a greenhouse. If you talk to people that grow in a greenhouse, ask them if they've ever had a mouse eat their seed that they were trying to germinate. Uh, most of the time, most greenhouse growers have experienced that. So even in greenhouses, we don't have full control of that environment. The other thing is it's in place for a period of time, maybe a few weeks from some of the shortest crops, but then maybe several months for others. And during that time, things can happen. Produce itself, meaning that part that we're harvesting is actually a favorable environment for microbial contaminants. Uh, so, so it offers the, the place for that contamination to grow. And even more difficult for us, microbes can become internalized in that product. So through natural features, not even wounds, but just things like stem scars, we can have microbes becoming internalized in produce. So it's not merely just a surface problem. Whenever we look at those pathogens, they're only identified through testing. Um, but again, and part of the reason is they all have similar symptoms. So we don't look to identify and track these outbreaks just looking at symptomology. It's actually done through testing. Uh, and of course, you, you may have wondered, you know, how did they know that uh, the contaminated romaine that went to 22 states was really all from the same farm or all those illnesses were actually linked? They do it through DNA testing. And so they actually uh, take samples from the afflicted individuals and they look at the DNA of the pathogen. And so they're actually able to say all these widely dispersed people were affected by the same problem. One of the complications to uh, responding to foodborne illness from a public health standpoint is how long it can take some of these uh, pathogens to intubate, uh, uh, to incubate rather, rather uh, b before we start seeing those symptoms. So if I asked everyone, what did you have for lunch 11 days ago? Probably a lot of us aren't going to have a clear picture of that. Uh, and that's exactly could happen with something like cyclospora. Uh, so if you look there, again, don't have to worry about really examining those in detail, but a lot of people think if they do have foodborne illness, it's the last meal they ate. Sometimes that is a sure possibility. Other times it may be days or even weeks prior that you were infected. If we were going through detail, and in fact, I've taught some classes where we looked at these in closer detail, there are some commonalities we find with these pathogens. And one of the primary ones, and one we're gonna focus on tonight is the source of those, where are they coming from? So these are actually some language I just ripped out of a longer presentation. So talking about the different pathogens, all these different statements associated with cattle feces, ingestion of food or water contaminated by infected stool, 
uh, excreted in fecal matter, transmitted via the fecal oral route. The fecal oral route sounds exactly like what it is. Somehow you are consuming feces. Uh, obviously not something that's pleasant to talk about, but it is a primary transmission route for some of these pathogens. Uh, so again, what this tells us the number one threat to food safety and particularly produce safety is fecal matter. And what we have to understand is fecal matter is not just coming from animals. It's not just the birds flying overhead. It's not just the deer that may enter into our production area. It's not just the neighbor's cattle or our own cattle. It can also include humans. So we always look at fecal matter as suspect because it is a source of pathogenic microbes. Now, there's no guarantee that a particular uh, fecal matter, in this case, a cow patty, is contaminated with a human pathogen, but we always act as it is because it is such a reliable source of those. Second consideration that we look at with food safety, water. Contaminated water can be a source of microbes, but it also does a great job of being a vector. It moves that contaminant around on the farm and takes it from a place where it's not a problem for us, and quite honestly, to where it becomes a contaminant. And so we have to understand how water moves on our farm, what sort of water sources we have, and how we use those. One of the immediate thoughts you may have is, well, if we're talking about contaminated produce, why don't we just wash it? It's not as simple as that because contamination does not mean merely that there's some dirt on the surface of that produce. Yeah, you know, a, a clean looking surface may potentially be free from contamination, but clean does not guarantee it. And that's the danger. Uh, when Chris said that, you know, if there was a tomato with bird excrement, he doesn't wash it, he doesn't try to fix the problem, he just considers it a loss and moves on. That's absolutely the correct uh, act. The concerning thing for us as producers is what about the ones that the bird hit yesterday and that morning shower washed it off and now you don't know it was there. And so that's why we want to always make sure we're making good decisions when we have the option to, because quite honestly, sometimes we don't have that option. We may not know what had happened. And I want to stress that there isn't a curative approach to produce safety. The only thing we can do is prevent it. Um, when we look at responses to foodborne illness, it's complicated again by things like incubation period. Uh, I've been in the room in Kentucky when I worked for Kentucky Department of Agriculture, when there, there was a foodborne illness in um, Indiana that was associated with produce. And you actually had sort of conflict between federal government officials, different state officials, and who wanted to do what and who wanted to release what when. Uh, it's not the most efficient process. Uh, and what I mean by that is we can't say, well, we've got a good health system. We've got good public health authorities in our state. We'll just let them deal with it if there is a problem. It's not a good strategy. Prevention is the only way we can have an impact on this. So, when we adhere to the best practices contained in GAP, that reduces the chance of contaminating produce with microbial pathogens, as well as some other contaminants. If we look especially at GAP certification, there's some el other elements they look at. It's not solely uh, contamination from pathogens. But what I wanna stress is that GAP cannot eliminate risk. There is no such thing as zero risk produce. I want to also stress that just because you have GAP certification and have passed that inspection, that doesn't mean you are safer than anyone else. Some of the worst outbreaks with produce have been from operations that had passed GAP certification inspections. So again, follow those practices and don't assume, even if you are an operation that chooses to go through that certification process, that doesn't mean you're safer than anyone else. Everybody should be following those practices and it gives us the best chance. So quickly, we'll go through kind of the process on the farm. This is not gonna be exhaustive uh, when we talk about the different examples in here, 
just simply don't have the time. But hopefully this gets you thinking about some of the concepts and you'll want to look at some of the uh, additional materials that you'll be sent as resources. So first, you identify the sources of microbes. And so, you know, we've already talked about fecal matter, so livestock, wildlife. Septic leach field, is your septic system working correctly on the farm or is it coming to the surface and posing a problem? Sick employees, um, you know, I, it hasn't been so much recently, but you know, in the past few years, there have been some outbreaks related to hepatitis and with food service employees. At the end of the day, that was about improper hand washing. So sick employees can be a source of contamination on your farm. Equipment can become contaminated. Uh, so if we think back to the cantaloupe outbreak, the Jensen Brothers Farms in Colorado, ultimately that was contaminated equipment. C equipment they had repurposed that really probably wasn't the best practice to be using in that type of washing system. They weren't able to clean and sanitize it effectively and that equipment created the issue contaminated water. So maybe, you know, if we go and look at testing surface water in our region, I can virtually guarantee you there's going to be generic E. coli in there. That's the nature of surface water. So certainly it's not something we're going to want to be washing produce with. Uh, but again, there's those things such as flooding events, uh, dust, you know, we may think of water running off, but even dust can be an issue in spread contamination. Spills can happen. Uh, it may be more chemical in nature than biological, and accidents do happen. So we know that we can have a plan if things don't always go right. Real quickly, some of the other concerns that kind of fall under the umbrella, things like broken glass and plastic. So typically on GAP certified farms, they do not allow glass in the packing or farming areas uh, from a standpoint of like containers uh, because it removes the possibility of there being an issue. Um, equipment leaking. So what happens if you have a hydraulic hose blow uh, on a tractor and you've got, uh, you know, harvested product and it gets hydraulic fluid all over it? What are we going to do? Uh, unlabeled chemicals or pesticides. Uh, on the right there, you see the school cafeteria worker mistakes detergent for sugar. Uh, this is from several years ago. Uh, happened in Ohio. Uh, there was laundry detergent. It, it was in an unlabeled container. A uh, worker thought that it was powdered sugar. They had put it on uh, some French toast. Some kids had bad reactions. No one died, uh, but certainly it's a great uh, example of what can happen when things aren't labeled. And if you've been farming for a while, I can about guarantee you, you have containers and packages that are not labeled. And while you may be very well able to tell what it is, if things aren't labeled, mistakes are easy to happen with other workers. So proper labeling of things like pesticides or other chemicals that you have on the farm is critical to make sure mistakes don't happen. We also get other weird things about contamination, such as um, golf balls that were in potatoes, uh, which, you know, is not a great thing, uh, as well as, you know, rubber bits, things that may get broken off of machinery and processing that happen for barbecued beef in this example. So there are other concerns that kind of fall under that big umbrella of gap uh, that we want to take steps and think about. What I like to think about GAP is look at the big picture of our actions. Pretty much anything we're doing on the farm, we want to sort of consider, is this improving food safety or this a, you know, a denigration of food safety? So for example, let's say you're harvesting produce and you want to keep it as cool as possible. We all know, get the field heat out as quick as we can and keep it as cool as possible. So should we be parking a wagon or a truck with produce on it in the shade under some trees? Well, the short answer is no. And why is that? Because birds could be in those trees and they could contaminate produce. Now what we can do if we want to park in the shade is make sure we're covering that produce uh, with, for instance, a clean tarp. Now we've removed the chance of contamination from fecal matter from birds that are overhead. So think about again, what are our actions and how do we do them in the best light under uh, food safety considerations? The second step, recognizing how those microbes move on the farm. So I've mentioned it before, water moves microbes very well. It's a direct threat through contaminated water, such as surface water, but also indirect when it comes to runoff or flooding that may occur. Um, 
We also want to look at contaminated equipment. So let's say you have a tractor. And actually, let me flip to the next page. Let's say you have a tractor and you're rolling through currently used pasture and you get to the vegetables and it's an older tractor, maybe an ADN or something like that. And you put your hand on the tire to hop down. What did you in essence just put your hand in? Manure, because you drove through a currently active pasture where we have animals grazing and of course manure. And if you're putting your hand on that tire, you're putting your hand in manure for all intents and purposes. And so some small things like not doing that or having hand washing available at the farm with the, at the field level with a portable hand washing station can help alleviate concerns with that. Um, let's say you do have a diverse operation, you have those livestock. Are you wearing your muck boots from feeding livestock into your vegetable production areas? If you are, you're carrying manure into those areas, raw manure, untreated. And so that's a concern. And we may want to consider having a set of especially boots of dirty boots that stay with the livestock area and then clean boots that are in the vegetable area. What if we have a harvest tote and you need to go out and tag uh, some calves so you throw the ear tags and tools into that and you have it out there around the animals on the ground and then you take it and put it back in the produce area, but you don't wash it. Is that a concern? Absolutely it is because we're putting that in exposure to, again, sources of potential contamination. What if you have a dog, cat, or in my case, because we have a pet guinea pig, what well, if we let the pet guinea pig roam free on the farm? That's a concern. Animals do not understand food safety. Uh, so it is important that we do consider that with our pets as well as our livestock. Uh, what if you have a cattle pasture that drains into your field? Maybe it's not your cattle or your pasture. Maybe it's the neighbors. How do you deal with that? Uh, or what about an uh, employee who's packing produce, but they aren't washing their hands properly? Even if you don't have employees, I bet you have some family or friends that may be helping you in sometimes. Are you making sure they know what the expectations are? So that's important. So all of this may cause you to ask the question, can we use manure for fertility given that fecal matter is a concern? And we can in a couple of different ways. If we have a treated product that's treated through heat treatment, or composted, then the manure can be used within uh, pretty much any general time frame. If it's not treated, then we have to be real specific about when we use it. Now, composting, I could talk several minutes on it. I'll just say this. If you don't have documentations of actively turning the compost and of recording temperatures that it reached, it's not compost if there's animal products in it. Consider it raw manure because there are very stringent and specific requirements on temperature because the, if you reach a high enough temperature, you kill pathogens. If you don't, then it's just like using fresh manure. So if you're not documenting or if your compost source is not documenting, then just consider it as raw manure. So what we do when we have raw manure is we follow the 90 or 120 day rule that comes directly from organic certification. And what that says is if the crop is in contact with or close proximity to the ground, the raw manure must be applied and incorporated no later than 120 days prior to harvest. If in fact it is not in contact with the ground, then we can look at it being 90 days prior to harvest, a less stringent requirement. Uh, it is important, it does talk about being applied and incorporated. That incorporation helps reduce the risk of uh, contact between our produce and that manure. And again, so this is how we can use raw manure one way. Another way we can do it, I don't have a slide on it, but use manures in the off season on cover crops. That also gives us that distance of time and helps us to be safe while using those raw manures or those manures which we don't have records for even if it has been composted. So we're not saying you can't use animal fertility inputs. We just say they have to be used in a manner that uh, gives us the best result from a safety standpoint. One of the things that you do with GAP is create a farm plan. Oddly enough, even if you have to meet the full requirements of FSMA, there is no requirement for a written farm plan. 
And while this sounds daunting at the outset, there's actually a lot of good resources out there that get you started, different templates, different examples. Uh, so it's not something you have to uh, recreate the wheel. You do have to adapt it to your farm. No two farms are gonna have exactly the same plan, even if you're growing the same commodities in the same region. Every farm is unique. And so it allows you to look at the overall production picture, you do simple things like map out fields and actually mark where are the concerning areas and how do we separate those. Um, you look at the history of fields, exposure to roads or possible flooding. Uh, but again, you don't have to start from zero. Uh, you'll get some resources on this and I'm happy to help you if you wanna look at doing this. And a big portion of GAP is, are you training those employees in these processes? And again, I'm saying employees, but very often on small farms, they're unplayed individuals that are helping us. Um, if you have a UPIC operation, what are you doing in that regard? Do you have hand washing facilities there for people that are coming for UPIC? Um, I've seen some CSAs who may offer something like raspberries or something like that, where they'll say the members can come and harvest those themselves, that they'll not actually be harvested by the farm. If you're doing that, is there a way for those folks to come and wash their hands and actually? Um, be able to do that in a, in a good manner. So just think about those sorts of things. I've said it, every farm is different. Uh, examples that are out there are broadly applicable, but you do tweak those for your operation. Don't assume that just because an example of a plan says X, Y, Z, that that's the only way to do it. And to me, when we're looking at implementing practices, we're really trying to say we want clean hands, clean water, clean soils and clean surfaces interacting with that produce. Again, it's not uh, rocket science that we're dealing with. It's some basic things to get in place and just to follow those. One of the things that I can probably skip really quickly, thanks to COVID-19, unfortunately, is proper hand washing. So I've been talking about proper hand washing for 10 years. I know everybody's like, ooh, well, let's wash our hands now, like it's something new. But reality, we've been training farmers to do this for really since probably about 2008 or even a little bit earlier than that. And, you know, it is a process. It needs to be done with intent because so many people do it wrong. Uh, this just real quick shows parts of the hand that are often missed. Those in red are often or most missed. The ones in yellow are often missed. How many of us can pick produce and not use our fingertips? I can't. So I mean, you know, when you look at people fail to do hand washing correctly, again, to me, it goes back to hepatitis outbreak and food service handlers. I've seen some restaurants that will have like on their door that all their employees uh, have taken the inoculation for hepatitis and that's great, but I'd just rather they wash their hands really well and do a good job with that uh, because that's concerned to me whether or not um, I would get hepatitis from them failing to wash their hands properly or not. So again, hand washing, as trivial as it may seem, is important. The use of gloves, it is not a requirement. So one thing I did when I worked at Appalachian Harvest is they sort of had a requirement that, you know, you had to use gloves when handling produce. The problem is, it's not always feasible or good. So like when you're on a wash line washing certain produce, it really just gets water inside your glove. And so it doesn't really offer any benefit or any protection. Certainly there's no FDA regulation. Um, but one thing I always tell people is gloves are not magical germ destroyers. All they are is a barrier. And so when you use gloves incorrectly, it's worse than not using them. So as long as you're washing your hands before you start, for instance, handling produce, it doesn't matter if you have gloves or not because there's nothing that the glove does. It doesn't disinfect your hands. It doesn't create a magical shield for that produce. All it does is prevents you from touching that produce with your hand. The reality is in a lot of operations on the farm with produce, you're gonna rip and tear those gloves anyway. So if they did offer some magical protection, it's gonna go quickly away. So if you're properly washing your hands, gloves are in no way a necessity. The one thing I will say where I think gloves do have a time to shine is if we do have any sort of wound or something that has a bandage on it. If it's on our hand, adding that glove just adds an extra layer of protection as another barrier between the wound 
and the produce. So that's the one time I would say you probably should wear gloves. But one of the things that happens too is people don't clean, don't change their gloves as often as they need it. So as gloves become soiled, as we're actually using them, we have to be changing them. And certainly right now where gloves may be in short supply, I hope you're happy to hear that gloves are not an absolute necessity. Uh, it is something that could be optional for your farm. You may want to do so, and there's certainly nothing wrong with it, provided you're properly washing and drying your hands before you put those gloves on. Another thing to consider, hand sanitizers. They do not substitute for hand washing, especially on the farm. Sanitizers can only be used effectively when the surface they're applied to is clean. What happens is if there's dirt and oils on our hands, uh, we may have pathogens that do not contact that hand sanitizer if we don't first remove the dirt and oils on our hands. So they are a good thing to add into the mix of hand washing not a requirement, again, proper hand washing does a great job of removing pathogens from our hands, but that certainly can't stand alone. So it is not a substitute for hand washing. So this is where the portable hand washing stations at the field level make a lot of sense if you don't have hand washing available on your farm. We do want to talk quickly about surfaces and things like that. There is a difference between clean and sanitized or clean and sanitary. Free from obvious dirt or soiling is basically the definition of clean, and that is not sufficient or good enough for food contact surfaces. We actually want to sanitize. And to sanitize, the simplest process is just to look at it in three steps. We wash, removing dirt and debris with soap or detergent and physical action. Typically, that's some sort of scrubbing. We don't like to use um, high pressure water typically because what happens when you use high pressure water is you have small uh, droplets form. And when you have small droplet forms, they drift, they move. So if you do have a contaminated surface, you may be spreading that contamination over wide areas. So we don't like to use high pressure. Typically, it is physical action with scrubbing such as brushes or cloths. We then rinse to remove all the cleaning um, product, the detergent, but also that loosened material. And then we use a sanitizer to kill microorganisms that may be present. A sanitized surface or sanitization is looking at reducing microorganism levels to a safe level from a public health standpoint. What I mean by that is you're not going to kill every single possible uh, microbe that is on a produce sorting table, for instance. It's unrealistic to think that you would be able to do that. But when we use sanitizers as part of that three-step process, we reduce their levels to where we're safe. Because we've probably heard the adage, the dose makes the portion, the, the poison rather, very much so the number of microbes present uh, influence whether or not uh, we are potentially harmed. The greater the number, the higher the likelihood. What sanitizers are allowed? This is important to talk about because there are some products that are not allowed with food contact surfaces or produce, uh, for instance. And so we always have to follow labeled rates and directions because sanitizers are actually a pesticide, believe it or not. The EPA views them as antimicrobial pesticides. And so there are labels just like we would find on our pesticide products we may use for insecticides or herbicides or fungicides in production. So here's an example, commonly available disinfecting wipe. Of course, I should mention the inclusion of a brand uh, does not in any way denigrate it, nor does the exclusion or not using a brand as an example uh, offer anything negative in that case either. But here's a commonly available, we can find these. If we just look at the product labeling on the front, kills 99.999% of bacteria. Sounds good, we don't want bacteria with our produce. Uh, if we look at the third little check mark, kills staph, E. coli, MRSA, salmonella, and strep. E. coli and salmonella are obviously concerns we have with foodborne illness, so this sounds great. But what does the label say when it comes to food contact surfaces? We actually read on there, it says, for surfaces that may come in contact with food, a potable water rinse is required. So if we ask the question, 
Is this okay on a food contact surface? For example, we want to wipe down tables that we're going to be putting produce directly onto. Can we do that? Only if we follow with a potable water rinse. And potable water is water that typically is municipal. You can look at wells and things like that if you have testing to back that up, but it's water that's proven to be of drinking level quality. So these are not allowed to directly contact produce through residue. So, and it's not just this brand. If we look to other disinfecting wipes, you will see the same exact sort of language that they cannot be in contact with food contact services without a potable water rinse. So understanding what products we're using and how to use them legally is important. Uh, pesticide labeling is something that I've seen have a greater scrutiny with it for GAP certification, for instance. I can't really explain that, but it's just a trend I've seen. Uh, it's not just in our region. I've also heard the same thing from producers in other states. Uh, so here's another example. This is a product that is readily available at your friendly neighborhood Dollar General store. And I think that it's a law that you're not allowed to farm if you're further than 30 minutes away from a Dollar General store. So I'm sure everybody can find this product. Uh, if we looked at the label as it exists on the bottle, of this chlorine product, we're gonna see there is no mention of produce, food, or agricultural purposes on the label. So can we use this to wash produce? Well, this is where we've got to be a little bit of a detective because it's more than meets the eye on that label. When we look on that label, we actually see an EPA registration number. And again, remember I told you, antimicrobial pesticides or sanitizers are an EPA regulated pesticide. And we get information about how to use pesticides from their label. And how many of you have ever seen a fungicide or a, any other type of pesticide that has one of those little booklets attached to the jug? Normally they get ripped off, you get water on them, you can't read them after so long. Well, this one is kind of that scenario in that it's got one of those booklets, but it's not attached to the product because the where this is sold, they don't normally need all that detail. But if we take that registration number and do a Google search or whatever search engine you prefer, we actually come up with a 52 or 53 page, I think now it may be even 53 pages long of pesticide label for that product. And in fact, if we dig through it, there's a lot of detail and there's a lot of ways we can actually use this product on the farm, even for um, some disease control and things like that in a nursery standpoint of, of propagating woody materials, believe it or not. But if we look, sure enough, there's a fruit and vegetable washing uh, directions on there. And so we can actually use that product on our farm to wash produce if we want to. So again, the only way we're able to do that is that particular product has an EPA label that allows us to do it. We can't just substitute any generic uh, Clorox label or, or product rather. We can't use a generic uh, bottle of sodium hypochlorite, which I think is the correct chemical name for Clorox bleach. Because again, this comes back to EPA pesticide labeling and we have to follow the label. So we have to follow that name brand product. So don't look at this as a broad blanket for any chlorine type product. But for that particular product with this particular label, we're able to use it on the farm as a sanitizer. So the fourth step, if we're looking at this as that the gap process, we sort of plan corrective actions. And some of this, we sort of just look at scenarios. What do we do if we have animals feeding in the garden? How do we handle that? Uh, what happens if we have employees that cut themselves and they bleed on produce? Uh, what happens if maybe, you know, uh, there's other body fluids involved, vomit or something like that? What if we have light bulbs in our packing house and one of them bursts while we have product in there? Or maybe we uh, hit it with, you know, the bucket on a tractor because we were trying to lift something up or something like that. Uh, all of these are scenarios and corrective actions that under like USDA GAP, you would have some specific statements written up, planning ahead in case these happened. Doesn't mean you can anticipate every problem, but certainly there are some categories that you want to be thinking about out and developing solutions for. And there are some good materials to help you find reasonable solutions to these. 
the fifth step and the final step is looking at monitoring and documenting our actions. So from a certification standpoint from GAP, if it wasn't written down, it never happened. And if you ever talk to lawyers, they will tell you basically the same thing. So I think that having records, even if we're not going through certification, is still a good idea. One, I think it makes us more accountable to ourselves in that if we have a plan and we say we're going to keep these records, we're going to do this, then we follow through more likely when we have that written plan. But also it may help substitute. Let's say, for instance, you have a buyer, they're concerned about food safety, but they're not going to require you to do an audit. I think if you bring to them and say, hey, I take food safety seriously, we have a plan, we implement uh, these different actions, we keep these sorts of records, a lot of buyers, especially uh, if it's maybe not one of the larger entities, may be able to work with you a little bit on a gap requirement. And so I think, again, demonstrating you're taking it serious is always a good thing. One thing I want to leave you with, you're never going to reach a point with your farm where gap is over and done with you don't have to worry about it part of it is every season is different there's always evolution with on on the farm with your practices with things you're doing and what i find is farmers who have been trained in gap and who have taken it seriously i've seen some of them actually come and take a training a second time because they said you know the first time i didn't get everything and they're the ones that say you know I was looking at doing things this way, but then taking in consideration what we learned, we're now doing it this way. And it's not that they're changing farming, you know, as a definition. They're just looking at some practices. And my belief is small changes can have big impact on the safety of your farm products. Good news is if you were to be in a situation where a buyer is saying we have to have a GAP certification from you, there is a cost share program in the state of Tennessee. So take advantage of this. It's through the Tennessee Department of Ag. You see the contact info there. Um, I'll also include this on the list of resources, but definitely it is something that if you're going to go through the cost of GAP certification, it is very much uh, worth it to get a reimbursement of your cost. You can get up to $750. I would say if you asked me how much should I budget, I would tell most people to budget for around $1,500 for like a USDA audit. They're one of the cheaper ones. Uh, private entities often are higher due to travel costs associated with auditors. Uh, so definitely it's something that you don't enter into lightly. Uh, lightly, you do need to be specific with your preparations and you will want to budget for it. But again, there's never a requirement for GAP certification unless a buyer is looking for it. So there's my contact info again from the front. Uh, and I know this was a very quick overview, uh, very uh, cursory in a lot of ways, but hopefully at least has given you a, a few ideals about food safety on the farm. Okay, so Adam, thank you very much for, for the presentation. And, um, you know, basically it's just, it's good safety for anyone that's going to be producing food on the, on the farm. And, and for farms that I've been on, it's those farms that are dual that have the hardest problem where you've got animals and produce being produced because um, they just don't think about not wearing those boots from the barn over to the vegetable patch or something like that. Um, and uh, right now, if, if you have gap or organic certification, because a lot of the same things happen, that does help you in the state cost sharing program too, right? You don't have to have as much training because you're already had all this training. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So through 2AEP GAP certification, for instance, I think if you're GAP certified, you don't have to have uh, as many uh, additional supporting like classes. That That, that is a standalone uh, qualifier, I believe. We have a question from somebody that says, can you comment on the rules practices for you pick farms like strawberries? Sure. So generally what we see with you pick farms is one, you'll have restroom facilities available to the folks that show up. So porta potties most likely is what we see. Uh, you also will have hand washing facilities. 
Uh, so that's the ability for people to wash their hands before they go into the areas for picking. You wouldn't want to allow people to bring their own containers for picking. You would want to provide those so you know they're clean going into the field. Um, you wouldn't want people to have their pets or animals with them. So not allowing pets or animals there. And you could, you wouldn't have to, but you could even say no one under a minimum age. Um, that's a potential uh, re restriction you could place on it. But the biggies are, you can't be, uh, you have to, before you go pick, you have to wash your hands, only using the restroom in a facility, obviously not in the field, which I hope no one would anyway. But, uh, and, you know, also not allowing people to eat, drink, or smoke, or use tobacco in general in the field is another good one. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions they'd like to type into the um, basis? Um, so also the setup of your area might be important too, where you're going to wash your vegetables or, you know, um, it probably for our last question, do you want to talk a little bit about that? You know, you can't, where you are and your availability of water and things like that? Sure. So whenever we're talking about washing produce, uh, we have to be using potable water. And again, that's either municipal water or well water, for instance, that we have tested uh, to show that it meets that level uh, of safety uh, of drinking water standards. Um, so it is important that we're intentional with that. We also want to consider, you know, if we do have a wash area that it's not draining into production areas. Uh, and another thing too, you know, when we think about livestock, uh, if your neighbor has livestock, you may have very little control over whether or not they're grazing next to your field. But there are some things you can do. So uh, if that field has the potential to have runoff into your production area, you can create a berm there or a ditch there that diverts water away from your production area. So just because there may be a practice or an occurrence that might have some concerns associated with it, that doesn't mean you can't still produce. So a lot of this is, okay, we have examined our situation. There is a concern here. Now, how do we reasonably mitigate that? And so to me, a lot of this comes down to looking at your specific operation and then asking people, you know, what are some ways we do have cattle on our farm and here's the way we handle it. Does this, you know, in the light of uh, gap, does this make sense? Is this enough? And quite honestly, you know, sometimes it's nothing more, especially if it's under your control, than changing a rotation schedule of your pasture, where when you have produce there, the animals are not next door. That maybe you're cutting hay off of it in the summer when you're growing produce instead of using that as your primary pasture. So, you know, sometimes it is asking you to make some changes, uh, but it doesn't mean you can't have both animals and produce. All right. Are there any other questions before we, we end the session? Um, our next session is the 11th of June, and we will be visiting uh, Dwayne Gibson's uh, berry farm. And he produces, we'll be talking about uh, all of his berry production that he does on the farm. He has some high tunnels that NRCS put in, and he's also a hemp producer that's been fairly successful. So we will be doing another virtual tour on his farm to see uh, his blueberries, uh, which he's had for many, many years, um, and then what he's expanded into all kinds of other kinds of berries or fruit bearing uh, tripe bushes or plants, as well as talking to him a little bit about the hemp. It will be the same time on the 11th at six o'clock and we'll be putting a Facebook notice out and um, as well as uh, sending emails to people who have participated with us in the past. So again, I want to thank Chris and Adam uh, for your presentations tonight. And with no further ado, we will see you all hopefully in two weeks. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks.